The question posed to us was, as a nutrition and fitness coach, what is something that you've changed your mind about due to new evidence or experience disproving or a preconceived notion that you once held? Welcome to the show where we help you make smart nutrition simple. If you want proven nutrition strategies to help you build a better body and create the energy to show up for your family without overly restrictive and unrealistic dieting, then you're in the right place. Make sure to subscribe and enjoy this episode. Welcome back to another Coaches Roundtable. So I'm here with our amazing coaches, Dr. Dan Dodd, Coach Joey Solowich and Kim Shutt. Okay, so guys, what is happening? Welcome back. Today, the question posed to us was, as a nutrition and fitness coach, what is something that you have changed your mind about due to new evidence or experience disproving or a preconceived notion that you once held? So we are going to discuss the, the myriad of things that having all of us been in the nutrition and fitness industry for quite some time that we've changed our minds about. All right, take us away, Kim. Oh, good Lord. I think I might speak for the ladies when it, it's when we talk about this. There's so many things I've changed my mind on. Because um, I think when I really got started, say 15, 16 years ago, that's when the Instagram, Pinterest, all of that was real popular, the influencers. And um, so... I'll just do a whole laundry list and you guys can chime in. So earning meals or earning food. So you have to do this many burpees Mm. to earn this type of food uh, was one of the things that I believed in. (laughs) And so the the premise around that is is that you have to burn a certain amount of calories to earn whatever it is that you're going to consume, right? Right. Not that you earn food because you're alive and you're a human being. You just... You have to earn food through exercise. Okay. So you must torture yourself or punish yourself to earn these things that are cheat foods per se. What is the evidence or experience specifically that lended itself to you changing your mind on that, Kim? I'm curious. My own personal experience uh, is the biggest thing I'd say is um, just realizing like you don't have to earn these things. And um yeah, seeing my body change throughout the years, because when I was, quote unquote, earning these things, I was thin, but I didn't look the way that I thought I should look. I didn't have the muscle mass that I wanted. I didn't feel as good. Um, So just my own personal evidence, seeing it with clients, learning more, um, reading more, like, obviously, you have your basal metabolic rate. And I didn't know that in the very beginning, I was like, well, I have to burn as many calories as I eat. I'm yeah. going to wear my watch and I'm going to burn 1000 calories because I eat 1000 calories. Like, did you, did that change with you? Like I got to go crush myself in the gym and, and realize like, Hey, you don't, you don't need to crush yourself in the right. gym. That was the other thing I had on my list is I think growing up being an athlete too. It's like, if you don't hurt, you're not working hard enough. You gotta, you gotta train until it hurts type mentality. And I thought like, if I'm not su- pouring sweat and I'm not crushed by the time I'm done working out, then it was not a good workout. Um, it was like just ridiculous thinking. And, you know, like you have to be sore. You got to be sore and got to just crush yourself in the I don't, gym. I don't think it's ridiculous thinking at all. I think it's conventional wisdom thinking. In fact, I just had a client with a uh, call with the client this morning and we were talking about rest periods. And I think the, the, general consensus is just what you said. If you're not like huffing and puffing and sweating and almost like feeling like you need to vomit, then the workout wasn't hard enough. When in in reality, you know, we're, we're obviously trying to create the stimulus. And so that's why the, the rest periods are actually really, really important. So you're not alone. Yeah. That's a big one that I would have listed in terms of things I've shifted my thinking on over the past number of years, specifically been working with you and learning from you regarding strength training. Because I come from the the fight world, you know, boxing, MMA, jujitsu, where it's just like two minute rounds, what rest, let's do another two minute round. And if you're not throwing up at the end of your workout, it wasn't a good workout. And yeah, you burn a lot of energy doing that. But by virtue of learning how to strength train intelligently and and understanding that you actually want to be working with an intensity in your set that earns you that one and a half, two minute rest interval 
so that you can fully replete glycogen to then go crush the next set. That was just not a line of thinking I ever had. And now I find myself coaching my clients, folks in the gym who want to chat with me while we're working out on that exact thing. I'll see them like try to do their next set 30 seconds later and be like, hey, 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 take it easy. Like give yourself a minute and a half here so that that next set can can actually be a hard set rather than a half ass set because you weren't repleted enough to get after it. So that's been a big one for me, shifting away from that, just grind it out with no rest into actually leveraging rest intervals to get more out of your training as opposed to training from a state of exhaustion. Definitely. What else you got, Kim? Uh, I'll sleep when I'm dead. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good one. Who needs to sleep? I don't need to sleep. Uh, Then after three kids and getting very minimal sleep. Uh, I realized, oh, hell, I need to sleep to recover. And you're only, your workouts are only as good as your recovery, which never, I would have never thought that. Um, so I crushing yourself and then not sleeping on top of it didn't do me any services. Yeah. Do that's that one. It's much more important when you're older. Are you saying I'm old, Dan? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That and no, <laughs> but just sort of, you know, understanding thinking back when you're in college or, or even 25 and sort of late twenties, you just sort of bounce back a little bit. You can, you can push it for four or five days pretty solidly and then think, Oh, I'll take the weekend to play catch up. And, you know, you start hitting your forties and and uh, all of a sudden you're like, yeah, it just doesn't work that easily anymore. And, you know, you got to plan, especially if you're focused on some training attempts and, and, uh, and you're playing around with nutrition, you definitely have to include that in there. It, isn't it funny? I wish I knew then what I know now, because I, I look at myself back in my twenties and early thirties and I was not what I would have considered the peak or pillar of physical conditioning, largely because of these variables, you know, just working out the wrong way, not prioritizing sleep. And you can get away with it when you're 25, 30 years old. But then at 40, when you realize like, no, dude, I need eight hours of sleep if I'm going to function the next day, you think, man, what would it have been like at 25 if I had actually prioritized sleep? And working out until like, how would I have looked then? <laughs> Wait, ate appropriately, trained appropriately, slept yeah. appropriately, awake. And, and and had the benefit of youth at your back. You, <laughs> you know? but the problem is you would have been too naive and egotistical to accept that you know the the information coming in was legit, right? Like anyone telling you what to do, you're you're too naive to accept it as um as reliable say, screw you. I'll just do whatever, whatever I want to do. Right. Um, (laughs) okay. Uh, Kim, those are great. We'll come back for more. How about coach Dan? What do you got? I remember going to a conference. This was like 20 plus years ago, but uh, I remember walking through a conference with our good friend, Mark, and, and, uh, we went past and, uh, TRX bands, uh, the guy, the owner of TRX was there at the conference. And he was, you know, at that stage I had like a a person with their feet, in the TRX, they're doing push-ups, and then they'll, you know, doing some stability stuff. And we just looked at each other and kind of laughed and said, yeah, that's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> and, you know, 20 plus years later, like, yeah. So I, I think sometimes there was a good way just to make sure, you know, you open your mind because you just never know what can be effective and what can't be effective. It's sort of maybe a little bit of like, yeah, I being young and sort of dumb and thinking like, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. I know what's good, totally. what's not good. And, you know, missing the point. Yeah, I actually remember that very clearly of of thinking the same thing. And it's just funny how you contextualize things differently as you get older and as the situations change. And now for us, you know, we work with mostly general population, in which case there's been just a myriad of clientele whom we've started their exercise journey, their strength training journey with just body weight and TRX straps. And there's so many opportunities to just leverage those things towards the greater good um, instead of just being black or white or right dichotomous around training methodology, being dichotomous around nutrition. And that's a lot of my own stuff too, of what I've changed my beliefs around, um, which we can talk about in a little bit. But yeah, that's a good one. What, what do you got, Joey? Tracking macros. So <laughs> what? <laughs> So I don't know if you remember, Ben, I I imagine you do. But the first time I was ever a guest on your podcast, I I almost came in with guns a blazing against the idea of tracking food and how I just thought it was the absolute wrong approach to take, that it would create an unhealthy relationship with food, that it, it created this dichotomous thinking around calories in, calories out and good and bad foods. 
And, and to be fair, before I started working at Body Systems, my, my coaching style was far more based around, you know, what I would categorize as like habit-based coaching. You know, let's focus on how we build healthy habits rather than worrying about tracking every calorie we eat. And over the past three years of, of working with now hundreds of clients through Body Systems and just seeing the sheer power that tracking your calories has to help educate an individual about how foods work, how calories add up, how their body responds to certain types of foods relative to others. My entire thinking around the value of tracking calories has completely shifted to the opposite end of the spectrum of where it would have been three, four years ago. And it's funny, I'll, I'll say this to, to elaborate on that, just to, just to one, about 10 years ago, I had my first experience with tracking food where I just like, as a non- fitness guy just signed up for my fitness pal and started tracking food. And I lost like 20, 30 pounds, but I was your classic case of just, you know, 16, 1700 calories for a couple of months. And then I, I ultimately gained that 20, 30 pounds back. Mm -hmm. And then through the course of working with, with body systems and becoming a coach myself and learning a heck of a lot more about human psychology and how we relate to our environment and the food around us, et cetera, what I've really changed my thinking about is how to leverage tracking, not as a man, a mechanism for dichotomous thinking that you either are or are not somebody who tracks your macros, but more so how do you leverage tracking macronutrients as a mechanism to learn what behavior, skill sets, and habits it takes to eat an appropriate amount of food for whatever your goal is, calorie surplus, calorie deficit, calorie maintenance, and then kind of marry those two things together, the behaviors and the habits with the, the statistical numerical data that tracking provides you to create the best outcome for yourself or a client or anybody else. So that's 100%. been probably my single biggest shift in my time as a coach. Two things. One, I feel immensely gratified that you just said that. <laughs> I um, hoped you would. <laughs> and, and I knew you were going to say that too. Um, Number two is I myself have absolutely changed my tunes on calorie tracking as well. Because early on in my career, I was very much against calorie tracking, mostly because I just didn't have the experience personally of using it to my benefit. And nor did I classify myself as someone who had the, the, the tolerance or wherewithal to bother with tracking. And so the story that I was telling myself is you don't need that to be successful, mostly because I just didn't want to do it or know how to do it myself. But my client's results absolutely suffered because of that. And so by virtue of me hiring a coach that ultimately you know, mandated that I leverage that as part of the process and of course getting great results myself, it justified me starting to utilize those practices you know, within our business as well. And because of that, of course, like you eloquently spoke about, Joey, uh, of just, you know, leveraging that to help change behaviors and reinforce habits and looking at the nuances of calorie tracking, but also just really helping clients get really good results by virtue of that, much better results than, they, than I was getting earlier on in my career by more having more of a haphazard approach to the process. So I, I appreciate that you shared that. Can I piggyback off of that a little yeah. bit? Um, so for me, tracking calories gave me some freedom and I was so black and white. Like I can only eat these things and these are the only things I can eat. When I'm all in, I'm all in. I'm not going to eat X, Y, and Z. Well, then when I started tracking, I was like, hey, I can eat a little bit of ice cream mm -hmm. and I'm not going to lose my shit. Um, I can eat a little bit of this and I'm not going to ruin all of my progress. Um, I think it kind of goes back with those earning those foods. I had that mentality if I had to earn these foods and when you're eating good, you're not eating the, those things, but it gave me some food freedom and I didn't have to be so restrictive which make, gave me um, better compliance. So better compliance during that time. And then when I wasn't dieting, then I was more compliant when I wasn't dieting or like in a fat loss phase, I should say, um, because I could work those foods into my, my yes. overall diet. A hundred percent. And, and in, you know, 
for me, um, early on in my career, I was very, very dogmatic around my nutrition approach. It was because a lot of the way that I had to learn nutrition was uh, from a restrictive dieting mentality to help heal some you know, gastrointestinal issues that I was plagued with, which meant for me, no gluten, no dairy, minimizing sugar, you know, and being very regimented and, and rigid around my dietary approach, which because it worked for me, I started to feel better, started to look better. Well, then invariably that became my approach to help coach other people to try and get them the results that I had gotten, which meant these mandated food lists, meal plans, restrictive food lists, no gluten, no dairy, no sugar, right? I always talk about like no fun, all of these types of things, which made compliance virtually impossible. And so I was losing clients left and right and chalking it up to, well, they're, they're not committed enough, right? They're just not committed enough to the process, which we do things obviously very, very differently now. And it's not that there isn't a, a place to say, you know, you might want to consider eliminating the gluten or eliminating the dairy or reducing sugar intake or what have you, but it's not the one size fits all approach anymore. What else we got? I got a good one. Uh, and this was by virtue of, of me sort of playing Australian football and being very endurance, but uh, thinking that running and cardio was the, the way to change you know, your composition, right? Like your body composition, because I was always lean, right? When I was an athlete, I was running all the time. I was very endurance based. I was, you know, if I put on a couple of pounds, it's like, well, I'll just go for a 10K and back down I am and I'm good again, thinking that the, that the cardio and the running was going to be the uh, propulsion for, for any changes. And then you get to, again, 30 and you're like, this is no longer working the way it does. And, you know, or not even really even 30. And, and sort of going, okay, well, you got to change things, right? There's got to be a bigger emphasis on lifting. I want to layer on top of that because I've, I've shifted my thinking on, on that exact topic there and back and there again. So I, I, when I went on my own 80 pounds of fat loss journey, it was through sheer brutal cardio. I didn't lift weights. I went to the boxing gym. I'd run five miles. I'd do a 60 minute cardio boxing class. I'd go spar in the ring. It was all cardio. And of course I lost a lot of weight. There was a ton of output and I was calorie restricting like crazy. So it stands to reason that I lost weight. And therefore I thought cardio was the answer. Then I started strength training intelligently. Enter Ben Brown with the programming you provided me. And suddenly I realized over the course of a couple of months, like, wait a minute, dude, I weighed the exact same amount as I weighed when I was doing all cardio, but I look a hell of a lot better. Now that I'm lifting these weights, I started to see my body composition change, build more muscle. So then of course, being dichotomous as we all can be sometimes, I went all in for two, three years there on strength. Like cardio is a waste of time. You just need to go to the gym and lift weights. That's all that matters. Lift weights, lift weights, lift weights. Don't do cardio, get your steps in. That's all that counts. And really in the past, maybe six months to a year, I've started to shift my mindset back, but in a more balanced fashion to, you know what, it's not one or the other. It's a healthy combination of both and yes. totally dependent on the unique circumstances of the individual who you're coaching. So they're back and there again on the cardio versus strength training front, ultimately to land somewhere in the middle. Hey guys, I want to interrupt this conversation briefly with an exciting announcement. If you're a father and struggling to lose the pounds that have crept on over the years, I understand your challenge. You're juggling a successful career, a loving family, and now you're looking to regain that energy and physique that seems to have slipped away. And that's exactly why I created PrimeFit Operating System. PrimeFit OS is a unique hybrid coaching program designed specifically for men like you. Now, you guys know me, we're not about quick fixes or impossible routines. Instead, we focus on real sustainable change through personalized nutrition and science-driven strength training, all wrapped up in a supportive community with expert guidance directly from me and my 20 years of experience working with men just like you. Imagine mastering your nutrition without restrictive dieting, getting stronger and leaner and boosting your overall energy, all without overwhelming your already busy schedule. With Prime Fit OS, you're getting more than just a cookie cutter nutrition and fitness plan. You're embarking on a transformative journey that fits into your life, not the other way around. So if you're ready to take the first step towards a healthier, leaner, stronger, more energetic, confident, ass-kicking you, join us over at Prime Fit Operating System. 
Trust me, guys, your family, your career, and most importantly, you will thank you for it. So if you guys are interested in getting started and want to find out more about the program, let's chat. Just head over to primefitos.com forward slash call and grab a time on my calendar. Remember, it's your time to be at your prime. I love that you shared that because I've been very much the opposite of Dan my whole career as never being someone who did much cardio outside of playing sports and hated it. It was like, screw it, made every you know rationalization as to why we don't need it. Strength training's the way. And to be fair, some of the gurus that I learned from along the way, you know, um, poo-pooed cardio. And so for a long time, my mantra was, you know, no cardio, you don't need it. But now it's much more so from the metabolic benefits. It's, we're not talking about cardio to lose weight. We, we're very, very clear about that. But we're talking about cardio for the health benefits of infusing it, um, you know, metabolic benefits, blood sugar benefits, longevity benefits of being something that's very, very substantiated and warranted and something that we absolutely want to infuse and something that we very much do infuse into our training programs, especially in the early stages of programming, because we see what significant results people can get without having to jump into a gym or training four or five days a week, or even feel uncomfortable about the strength training process. There's a lot of benefits that we can get from just low intensity cardio uh, in terms of, yeah, body composition, health, energy, and, and to say nothing of, you know, fat loss and, and weight changes. So let's get uh, one or two more and then we'll wrap it up. I think I have one that's probably more specifically for the ladies, like not lifting too heavy. Cause if you lift too heavy, then you're going to get bulky. So that was a big one in the beginning where it was like, I'm doing all this circuit training. I got my pink weights and I can't lift too heavy because I'm going to get too big of muscles. Yeah, that's totally shifted. So what I'm hearing is that, um, and, and I think the conventional wisdom around that, right. Is you need to do higher reps, lower weight to tone, right? Yes. To uh, to build to the T word to build yeah, to tone <laughs> to build longer and leaner muscles, yes. and you need to lift heavier to build muscle size, right? And that's kind of this this fear for women is that they're gonna simply walk into a gym and all of a sudden. Uh, start to build, you know, gargantuan uh, muscles, right? And let's be real, I'm no small girl. So at 6'2", I don't want to look like a man because I'm lifting these heavy weights. So I definitely didn't want to look like a man. So I was like, oh, give me all the pink weights. Now I'm like, no, give me all the heavy weights. (laughs) What's been your experience, Kim? I mean, once you started lifting heavy, what did you observe in your own body composition that was favorable relative to what you thought would happen initially? I actually saw definition and it was so hard to put on muscle minus that first like year uh, where I put it on relatively quickly. Um, But to add additional muscle to that, it took so much work um, where I thought it was just like Ben said, I'm going to walk into the gym and I'm going to just get huge and bulky and manly. Um, But no, it took a lot of work and calories. So when we did a strategic building phase, which is the first one I'd ever done. And it was working under Ben. Um, I had to eat a lot of food and train really heavy, which for me, I thought I was just going to put on all this muscle, just eating like I was eating and going to the gym, which was not the case at all. So again, experience, um, yeah, definitely experience with myself. And it's interesting because I hear it a lot with, with women. They're like, Oh, I don't want to get too big or I don't want to lift too heavy because I don't want too, too big of muscles. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time too. And create. some pretty special genetics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it just doesn't happen. And, and I, you know, make a case is like, look at all the guys in the gym that are cranking away every single day for hours and not changing at all. If, if only it were that easy to put on muscle mass, you'd have dudes walking around absolutely jacked and it doesn't happen that way. So it's, it really is this, this perfect storm of nutrition and training volume and genetics and recovery and doing it over and over and over again. One of the things that 
I haven't changed my mind about um, is CrossFit. I still think it's dumb for a myriad Ooh. of reasons. But one of the things I appreciate about CrossFit is the acceptance of heavy lifting for females specifically. And if you just look at now, listen, to be fair, some of these women are pretty big. Um, and there's definitely some, we'll call it ergogenic aids at play um, with them. But the point is, it's like, if you want to get leaner, if you want to get more tone, if you want to have more muscle definition, like obviously your nutrition matters a lot, but also train your training intensity, your training volume um, matters a lot. And you can't just sit on the hip, you know, adduction, abduction machine um, and gain muscle mass. You need to lift heavy weights. You need to do big bang exercises. You need to train full range of motion. You need to train with intensity. Um, and so it's certainly one of the things that I'm really appreciative around that training paradigm. Anyone got anything else? Otherwise we will kind of wrap it up here. One right. more for me that I was, I'm always reluctant to bring this one up because it's such a contentious one, but, but alcohol as it pertains to progress, mm. I, I used to think, and this is true that you could drink as much as you wanted to drink, as long as you ate right and you trained. And again, when you're 25, 30 years old, maybe you can get away with it. Maybe you can't. But the more I coach and the more I, I have my own experience and relationship with alcohol that's evolving, the more I've become settled, settled in on the, the fact that, quite frankly, alcohol can be a massive limiting factor, you know, especially as a population that, that we're working with, that north of 35, north of 40 years old population. And uh, that, that's been a huge shift for me. You know, I used to kind of support the argument like, no, you can have some drinks and get away with it. You'll be fine. And now I find myself more and more saying, are you sure alcohol is not the limiting factor here? So I don't 100%. know what you guys think of that. Yeah. As much as I would love to rationalize it otherwise, you're dead on, especially the older we get of inability to recover, poor sleep, poor blood sugar regulation. It's... It's about so much more than just the calories that it contributes to. And we, we've talked about this a lot, but you know, we just had our men's group coaching call prior to this and invariably it comes up every single session of one of the major, if not the biggest limiting factor that, like you said, Joey, that keeps our clients from getting the results that they said that they want for themselves to really have to reflect on how are these weekend behaviors, nighttime behaviors actually serving me on paper from a calorie standpoint, it might not be, you know, putting you over, but from a metabolic hormonal standpoint, you're, you know, just swiping your feet out from under, under you in so many different ways. So I'm glad you brought that up. I I'm, I'm a hundred percent with you there. And I think, you know, just big picture here, uh, I love this type of conversation and hopefully it's helpful for our listeners because at the end of the day, you know, I think we we have to be changing our perspectives as we learn more, as we get more practical experience, as new data provides, you know, um, it provides itself around the ways in which we get healthier, get leaner, get stronger. Um, there's always better ways to do things. But again, it's so contextually dependent on where we are in our life and, and responsibilities and everything like that. But if you have a coach or you're following someone that is so rooted in their one way, almost this, this myopic or dogmatic approach to this is the only way to do things, then I think it's probably fair to run away um, and acknowledge that person probably has something to sell you on the back end, um, or they're not getting great results, uh, necessarily getting great results with their clientele. Cause you, the amazing coaches that I'm having a conversation with right now, in addition to, you know, so many of the coaches that follow us that we learn from can, would, would certainly agree with us that there's just a lot of ways to do things. And I think any coach that's worth their, their weight is constantly learning, constantly growing and constantly acknowledging that they don't know what they don't know. We all have blind spots and there's more for us to learn along the way. So I appreciate you guys jumping on with me, sharing your 
your story with us. And uh, for those of you listening, thanks so much. Hopefully this was helpful for you. And we'll catch you in another Coaches Roundtable next month. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. And if you found this content valuable, here are four ways I can help you in your nutrition journey for free. One, grab a free copy of my Fat Loss Fix Guide at fatlossfixguide.com. Two, join my free group at smartnutritionmadesimple.com. Three, subscribe to my YouTube channel at smartnutritionmadesimpletv.com. Four, leave a five-star rating and positive review so that we can gain access to more nutrition experts ready to share their knowledge with you and ultimately help more people make smart nutrition simple.